Everybody is holding events these days. They're a great way to get your ideal customers together and introduce your company to a new audience. But it's really hard to get people to attend, isn't it? I mean, it seems like everyone's doing it. And what makes your event so special? How can you get them there? And when they're there, how do you actually make sales? I mean, just the fact that you can have an event doesn't mean it's going to work. Well, on today's show, we're talking about how you can draw a crowd with event marketing with Diane Crowley. Welcome to Small Business Rally Point. This is the official weekly meeting of the small business community everywhere. I'm your host, Pat Miller, the Idea Coach. Thank you, of course, to our sponsors, Bank 59, Quick Trip, Serendipity Labs, and shout out to the Idea Collective Collaboration community members in the audience. These are the small business owners that have chosen to co-work and collaborate to build their dream together. Now, this show is 100% interactive, so that means the more loud and proud that the chat is, the better. So you got questions, comments, or sarcastic remarks, and with Roger Wolkoff in the audience, I know we'll have that. High five, Roger. Get your comments into the chat. That's what makes it fun. And then after the interview, we'll hang out. We'll chat for a little bit with the Quick Trip After Party Networking, so that way you can meet everybody that was on the call and perhaps make some new connections. Well, let's get down to it. Diane Crowley is our guest, and Diane, it's great to see you again. Because yes. we worked together back in the day, and last time that we worked with one another, you were like the queen bee of a Harley Davidson dealership, but you've done so much more than that when it comes to events. So if someone hasn't met you before, uh, tell us about who you are, what you do, and what you've done, because I, I know it's a lot of great stuff. Well, first, Pat, I want you um, to know how much I appreciate you letting me be on your show today. This is awesome. And I always have to laugh a little bit when people say, back in the day, because it makes me feel super old. I know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Queen Bee, uh, it's a wonderful title, but um, yeah, just really a lot of a lot of hard work. And uh, when I went into the position, and this is, you know, seven or eight years back, that um, it was just months before a little thing they called the 110th anniversary of Harley Davidson. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I was going through the interview process. I was, you know, about to be hired. And my boss at the time uh, who I was speaking to said, you know, we've got this, this little event coming up, the anniversary. Don't worry. It's pretty much all set. You're just going to have to put a few little finishing touches on it. <laughs> Well, yeah, flash forward, and this is like three months before a five-day event, um, flash forward, I, I pretty much had to take a stick of dynamite to anything that was there and rebuild from scratch. So that was the beginning. That yeah. is a heck of a way to get started. Now, that was like right when you had just started at the dealership. And yes. for scope and scale, how big was that promotion? Because the 110th was a huge celebration. It was huge because not only was it just a one dealership event, it was combining with all of the area dealers um, and literally the anniversary events pull from not only all over the state and all over the region, but all over the country and even all over the world. So you're looking at an international event and you're looking at something that's five days long. And, you know, when, if you have ever set foot or done anything in any scope for an event, you'll realize the amount of work that it takes to build something that had, um, I believe at that time we had three stages, something like 30 different bands to book, um, a multitude of food vendors, making relationships and creating the setups for beverages, beer, um, and then, on top of that all, I had no staff. So I had to very quickly develop um, an internship program. And <laughs> um, it actually was a win-win for everybody because there are a lot of people out there, especially students who want to get into the event space in some way, shape or form. And you know, it was sort of a, a win-win as I mentioned that they were able to get some really great hands-on experience and in exchange, you know, I got some workforce. But um, the 110th was literally me and four unpaid interns. And you had to make it work because it was kind and of- We important. made it work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It was, I, I won't say we, uh, that we kept our sanity through the whole thing, <laughs> but it did work. <laughs> 
Yes. Well, you've done much more than just the Harley dealership, though. Tell us some other things that you've done and what you're doing now, because you're not done with events, even though you're not at the Harley dealership anymore. Right. And that's so true. And, and you know, I'm really grateful for that time because uh, it enabled to get for me to get to know a really cool group of people. Motorcycle riders are some of the most wonderful people, just warm, um, dedicated wonderful people and and so to provide them with great events was one was an amazing thing um and in addition to that it was um really neat to be able to create it really gave me a canvas to create one of the biggest things harley davidson at the time was trying to do was to bring in what they called non-traditional riders so that would be younger people that would be females um that would be people that don't already ride motorcycles now, full transparency, I'm not a motorcycle rider. So this is true marketing because I had to get behind the eyes of the consumer. And I also had to, but I had the benefit of being that person they were going after. So I created events um, that I knew that non-traditional rider that would pull them in. One of the things that we found was that um, people that have never been in a motorcycle dealership for whatever reason are kind of intimidated by the experience. We're not sure why, but the goal then was to create things that would make it less intimidating so that they would just come in and that would expose them to the dealership. Once they're in the doors, it's kind of natural. You see all the beautiful bikes, you see all the nice clothes, you see the cool accessories. It, it's sort of a natural transition. But through that, I just you know mentioned quickly, non-traditional events like, and these were, I created these, I have to say, and I'm very proud of that. Um, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and the help of great people, uh, bikes and brews, a beer sampling extravaganza. Um, we did hog and steer. That was a barbecue competition. We did the green and gold tailgate party where we had Green Bay Packers on site for uh, autographs and, and a lot of things. I did numerous fashion shows. Um, I did, of course, the, the 110th and 115th, which were some of the bigger events, um, including the Milwaukee Rally among others. Um, so that it was a really interesting opportunity. And, you know, I've been able to springboard from that. And before that point, with a lot of additional things, I um, started out my career in college, you know, right out of college, started in radio. So Pat, you can, of mm -hmm. course, relate to that start. And that kind of throws you into a little bit of everything. <laughs> yes, it does. So, you know, I was uh, out of college, didn't really know, okay, you know, I, I know I want to do something with marketing, but, you know, only the broadest subject ever. Hmm. So I got the job in radio and was doing everything from live remotes at convenience stores and car dealerships to uh, writing copy and creating promotions, creating events, selling spots, you name it. Um, and then I eventually transitioned into TV, moved around a little bit, and um, eventually fell and knew I was in love with the event side of things. And um, that's when I transitioned into a really amazing event marketing agency, GMR, uh, who many people are uh, very familiar with. They work with all the brand names you know. Um, so major events that I did a lot on the West Coast. Uh, with names like Microsoft and Ford and McDonald's and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was also an amazing opportunity. Um, but, you know, flash forward now, all of those things put together um, really gave me something I never knew life would hand me, which was the chance to teach events at, um, at UWM, which I've been doing now for four years. So um, it, it's just really interesting where life takes you. It's perfect for you. Perfect for you. After doing a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of events hundreds. with all of that experience, right? So yes. let's, I like talking through the lens of the Harley dealership, if we can, a little bit, sure. because it gives someone something to hold on to. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that I can see how that theory or that point made sense for something like a Harley dealership. And you were talking about one of the objectives of some of your events was to woo the, I don't know why I said woo, where woo, <laughs> woo, woo, yeah. when you're supposed to woo the non-traditional writer. So I like is, that. why, why were events so important for that location? Well, you know, and it was something again, they, they were doing only on a very low level. Um, at, at one point, 
the thing with a lot of, and there are hundreds of dealerships all over the country, and I've gotten to meet a lot of people from different dealerships that were also in the same position I had. The interesting, interesting thing to note is that many dealerships and even Harley Davidson sometimes feels that having a marketing and events manager who's part of the team is almost a luxury. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some dealerships that literally the parts manager is also the marketing manager. So what I came into was something that was not at all built into an event culture um, and that it was a great opportunity. What we did, you know, the, the basics were, and, and every retail is different, but yet the same, to get, as I said, butts on bikes. Um, so the main thing was to sell motorcycles, the money's in the metals. So, you know, the, the main thing, and as I mentioned before, you now traditional riders, they go to all the dealerships. Um, they will go on rides, they will visit everyone. Non-traditional riders, as I also mentioned, have some factor of intimidation in walking in to that Harley Davidson Harley Davidson dealership for the first time, for whatever reason. So on the side of the riders, the people that have been riding for years and years and years, and you know that they're going to give their business to one of those dealerships. Um, and in markets like the Milwaukee market, there are a number of great dealerships. Um, you look at a bigger market like Chicago and smaller markets that um, the competition is between, because they're basically all selling the same thing. So to differentiate yourself, you have to create experiences. And I think this is true of any retail, any business, whatever you do, whether you're in law or finance or um, clothing sales, whatever it might be, that you want to create an experience. People will pay for an experience. People will single you out for that experience. So creating that experience for your consumer is really key. And um, when you're looking at somebody who's a non-traditional, you know, talking about that person you're wooing, that um, you want to give them something that they're going to find intriguing, that they already love, that they find non-intimidating. So um, events that I did, one that I, I didn't mention was the dog days of summer. So, you know, I'm also a big fan of giving back. I think that you should always take whatever you have in life, whatever leverage and talent and whatever talent you have in life to give back. So I love combining events with something that helps the community. The dog days of summer helped to provide awareness for many of the shelters and rescues for dogs around the area. So we created an event that had acoustic music, it had food, it had um, a lot of dog related vendors. Um, and then I allowed the different humane societies and rescues to bring their, um, the dogs that they wanted to get adopted to the event also. Um, and the other thing that it did aside from helping these rescues and helping these humane societies and getting exposure for the dogs, was it was this huge draw. People could also bring their dogs to the event. And you know, at, uh, with this particular facility, there were acres of green space that weren't used and just kind of a beautiful setup. And when you provide the right atmosphere with uh, enough shade and tents and water and chew toys and pillows and everything else, um, it was a really, really uh, intriguing and engaging setting for not only dog owners, but people that love dogs. It happens that Harley, you know, generally for whatever reason, Harley owners are in many cases, dog lovers, dog owners. Mm -hmm. So it was a great synergy. Um, it brought people in that already were owners. It brought people in that um, had not yet ever thought of coming to the dealership because it engaged something that they were already familiar with and comfortable with, and that was their dog or their desire to have a dog. So that was one example of creating something that um, wooed the yeah. consumers. Yes. Wooed. wooed is the word we're going to go with today. So it, it, step yes. one seems to be understanding what's the point of having an event, right? The money's in the yes. metal. We got to sell some bikes. The second thing would be to understand who are you trying to attract to the event, like you were talking about non-traditional riders or or something along those lines, what would we do next if we're trying to build an event for our business? What else should we be thinking about to make sure that it actually works? That's a great question. 
what I always like to say is look behind the consumer's eyes. So in other words, think like that person. Um, I think the biggest mistake many people make when they are either creating an event um, and a really good example is booking music for an event um, that they very often will put in place what they like. They will, they will create something they, and unless you are the demographic you're going after, chances are that's not what you should be doing. <laughs> so, you know, for example, and full disclosure, I have, don't, don't be offended if you love country music. I appreciate country music. I've learned <laughs> to like much of country music. I am not a country music lover. Right. However, I book a lot of country bands because I know that's what consumers for certain events attendees want to hear. Um, you know, by the same token, you want to provide an experience that is uh, attractive to the person you want. If if the experience you're going after is for a you know 50 year old affluent man um, that loves hunting, you're going to create a whole different scenario than you know maybe a 25 year old female that loves fashion. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it's a matter of you have to build for what they like and what's going to bring them and what attracts them and engages them in the experience. Um, and you know, no two consumers are the same, but with a lot of educated, um, really, you know, a good educated gut, number one, but also the internet's a wonderful thing. Um, there's a lot of good information out there in terms of research. So looking behind their eyes. Is that how you said it? Looking behind their eyes? Is that what you said? Yeah. All yeah. Right. I, I love that phrase because you're right. You have to understand what's motivating them. And the lesson of don't book what you like is probably a good one. I think that's really sharp. Let's talk about getting them to act and getting them on the lot or into your store or whatever it is. What was your secret weapon? Was it an email list? Were you texting people? Were you mailing them? How were you getting their attention to get them on the lot to one of your events? Hundred dollar bills? No. Um, <laughs> be nice. Uh, nice. You know, some. You know, I guess prizes kind of are like that. But um, you know, the thing is to get them, and and I think we all know AIDA is attention, interest, desire, and action. The four major steps of marketing. Um, and you're right, so action, uh, you want to create, uh, you know, on the lowest level, you're going to create some kind of offer that entices them to come in. And, you know, in many cases, it was with some of our, our events, um, a good example would be a bike night for, that was kind of a core event for the core customer, that person you know that's going to go to some dealership somewhere, um, you want them to come to yours and you want them to stay at yours, Something as simple as a door prize drive. Now, I know that sounds really elementary, but people would come. Those prizes meant a lot to them. They would even come up and ask, when are the door prize drives? So you wanted to also, um, you didn't want to have them right up front and you didn't want to have them necessarily right at the end, but you did want to keep their expectations of exactly when that would happen. And generally, I even would do maybe a couple of door prize drawings um, to keep them engaged, first of all, but also to keep them through, through the whole event. Um, and it would draw them to the event, just knowing. And these, I'm not talking about anything that was a major prize. In many cases, it was something that we had partnered with a vendor, um, and it might be a baseball cap. Or it could be a, you know, a gift card, which is even better because it's bringing them back into the dealership. Um, so something that might cost us nothing up to maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 dollars mm -hmm. in some cases was huge in bringing in hundreds and thousands, sometimes thousands of people. Um, so, you know, things like that. Sometimes it's an offer just, you know, from a retail standpoint, if you know that you have something at a certain time of year people want. Um, if it's, um, you know, just giving them the, the ideas of gift cards, giving them uh, coupons for discounts if that's possible. Um, in some cases, it's not. Harley Davidson is very strict about the way you do discounts and coupons. Um, or just creating the idea of a sale. So it mm -hmm. might be, uh, we got, uh, we just got a new truckload of the 20 
you know, the 2022 bikes in, um, that would be a draw, depending on who you're looking at. Um, you know, on the other side of the coin, creating a fashion show that got a lot of people in that would have never stepped in the dealership before. And it got women to buy things that were on the rack that um, they may not have purchased before. One thing I want to hit on, uh, well, let me get off this question first before I move on. Were you using Facebook ads? Were you using email lists? How were you getting people's attention or was it just straight advertising? Oh, very good. And I'm sorry, I didn't touch on that point, okay. but advertising and promotion, incredibly important and the timing and the message and the synergy of it, I think is incredibly important. Coming from a media background um, has been, I think, a plus for me because I've been able to um, understand the, the inner workings, so to speak, of radio and to maximize it and TV and how to maximize that print and how to maximize, um, you know, print and that kind of promotion from my days at the Journal Sentinel. And then now the wonderful thing is social media, which, you know, if done right, it costs little to nothing. And the ability to uh, really hone in on that very, very specific consumer is amazing to me for just a few dollars. Sure. Um, the other thing, the digital world is fantastic. Um, I would also upkeep our website. And so keeping the message fresh and having the message, um, especially just simple things like keeping your event calendar updated is incredibly important. I see so many places now that, you know, they don't take that extra time just to put those events on their calendar. Sorry, I started laughing there because I got a message <laughs> this morning from Susie that my event calendar was out of date. So I had to spend the morning this morning getting my event calendar up to date because I was... I was uh, behind. So thank you, Susan. You're a bad boy. I was a bad boy. No. I know. You're a bad um, boy. So we're talking with Diane Crowley, and our questions are available. If there's something you want to know, put it in the chat because uh, Diane really knows her stuff. If you're trying to build events and get people to come to them, uh, this is really a great opportunity. I want to pretend for a second that we're one of your employees, okay? Because when you do so many events, you come up with a list of ways that people need to behave and things that you expect them to do to interact with the customer. So what did you tell your team to make sure that the dealership looked great and that the customers had a great experience? Because you can't just like sit down on your phone the whole time and expect to have a good interaction. That's, that's very true. It's, you know, I think that communication is so key. And as you, as you evolve with whatever, you know, the individual team you're with, um, you learn the process of what's going to be successful in getting things to look the way you needed them to, and to run the way you need them to. Um, as far as the events we had outdoors, uh, in that particular facility, we were blessed with tons of acreage and green space. And so it was a very nice blank canvas. Um, and aesthetics are really, I think, very important. Um, if we built a, a sports bar, it looked like a sports bar. Um, so I hope I answered your question correctly, but I, there's a lot of effort. There's always a lot of give and take. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of over communication that has to happen with the team. Right. Um, in order for things, I think, to look and run the way you need them to. We get some questions coming in. I'm going to get to them in just one second, but I want to follow up on one more thing that when I was doing events at the radio station, I always had to coach my team on. How did you talk to your team about the regulars, the people that came to everything? Did you tell them to love up on them or did you tell them to go find other people to talk to? Because everyone gets their <laughs> set of people that comes to everything. And I'm curious how you handled it. And that's very true. And I think radio stations get it more than anybody. Um, how radio personalities do it, I'm not quite sure because um, they have their fan base and, you know, they're wonderful people. And obviously fans are incredibly important, but um, it, it is strange because there would be people that, you know, in essence, without sounding the wrong way, it's, it's kind of like I had a following. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sure. And I don't mean that in, in at all a conceited way because it, it was just a natural part of the business. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, those people, you have to maintain respect for them and um, know that they're there with all the best intentions and they're sure. important. However, 
when you're running an event, unfortunately, you only have so much time and you're literally spread in 10 different directions. And so to maintain things and to keep things on time, um, I would always let staff know that, you know, we want to be cordial to everyone. We want to be respectful to everyone. We do want to address their concerns. Um, if it's something you feel personally you cannot handle, send them to me mm -hmm. um, because that's what I'm there for. So it would always roll uphill. I would ultimately handle anything that they couldn't handle. However, to me, ultimately, um, it's all about kindness and respect. It should yeah. always be all about kindness and respect. And um, there are those few people out there that, you know, are, are beyond that. And that, that's when you call security. And this is so funny, too, because the regular fans turned into the psycho fans because they exist, too. I can just say it out loud. Mm -hmm. They exist. Some oh, there's, yeah. there's, there's a portion of the regular fan base that's, a, you know, you need to back up, bro. I mean, that's for real. But <laughs> the real super fans, at least my theory on it was, is love them as much as you can while still making new friends. Because those people that come to everything, that's your base, right? You have yeah. to have them there, provided they're there for the right reasons. And when they're not there for the right reasons send them over to Diane and she can take care of it. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, we've got some more questions coming in and I promise <laughs> I will get to them in one minute, but I do want to talk about one more important part. How did you try and get those butts on bikes? You throw a great big booze and blues barbecue or something like that. And you get 500 people walking around the dealership. How did you engage them with the actual motorcycles to make sure that your salespeople had the opportunity to sell those bikes? What did you do? Well, you know, in some cases, some events were not necessarily meant for people to physically test drive or test ride the bikes that night, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some cases, it was at first step. And one thing I learned um, through Harley is that on average, it takes 16 visits for them to sell a motorcycle or six oh. exposures. So, you know, my goal is to get that those exposures as much as possible. And, you know, something like a Bikes and Brews, which was a beer sampling extravaganza, it drew in a lot of um, one of the main uh, demographics we wanted, which was uh, affluent couples. They love beer sampling, craft. We had over 200 craft beers and we had live music in two diff different mm -hmm. areas. And so it was this really kind of amazing thing. One of the areas was a tented area that was beer and music. The other was actually in the showroom. So it actually sort of got people as they would get their beer samples also past beautifully displayed bikes. So in many cases, because a lot of these people had never been to the dealership before, but came because of that event. It was their first exposure. Ah, oh, this is what a Harley Davidson dealership is like. Look at those motorcycles. Wow, they're so shiny and pretty. Mm -hmm. And that really looks like something I'd have fun with. And, you know, at very least, it was that first exposure. Or maybe it was the 10th exposure. But it got them in. And it got them exposed to our staff. It got them exposed to the product. Um, it got them to see the motor clothes and accessories. So again, just got them in the door. Um, the other things we try and do to get to get butts on bikes, when they got to a point of maybe a little closer, maybe they knew some of the bikes they were interested in, um, a lot of test rides, um, a lot of product display type events. The anniversary was a big opportunity for the new motor year bikes to come out and those would be on display. Um, so a lot of events like that, um, and it was just constant display. They also, I think one of the, the very ingenious things that Harley Davidson developed was something called the Jumpstart, which is a more or less a ride simulator. So if you've never been on a motorcycle before, they would give you the chance to actually sit on it and get the feel of riding. Yeah. Um, and for it was a great thing we used with women's events because it was the first time they even got a chance to do anything that felt like riding with no intimidation factor at all because yeah. it's all stationary. So that would convert a lot of people who had never thought about riding before to people who were considering it, which is huge. Um, the other thing they did specifically were classes. And the classes um, more or less would teach people how to ride and get their certification. 
You have so much to offer. I'm literally racking my brain to think of the questions to unlock it because you don't think that you, like you just gave us something there that maybe didn't seem like a big deal to you. But as we build this schematic of understanding the reason why you're having the event, who you want to have come to the event, how many exposures to the product it takes for them to buy, and then maybe the offer that it takes for them to cross over and make that purchase. Did you ever have that that trigger, if you will, that got someone to buy the bike? Did anything work as far as that conversion process? Well, you know, I was I was not the person that was in that final step. I was mm -hmm. more the person that kind of, I would say, hey, we're over here, bring them in, take yeah. them by the hand, let, guide them in the door, and then, you know, sure. and I'm saying that esoterically, of course, <laughs> that'd be really weird if I wasn't. Um, but uh, the thing is, and you know, every, every retail, every sales setting is maybe a little different, the mm -hmm. nuance and, and I won't say the issue with that particular product was that doing discounts or sales um, can be promoted in-house, but cannot be promoted on any external media. Right. So it's very hard to do what would be considered a typical sale, like your Target or your, your Macy's or your pick and save. Um, you couldn't promote sales um, and it was a very strict criteria in terms of how you did it, if you did it. So um, a lot of what had to be done to pull the trigger was internal marketing, was um, you know the salespeople literally then knowing their customers, knowing the people that had interest. Um, I brought them the prospects. I brought them the qualified prospects. Right. And then they would take them they would, you know, create their database, they would qualify them, and they would have an educated idea of what they were interested in. So then it was kind of up to them to know, okay, I know that Pat Miller came in and he really loved that blue sportster. Oh, yeah, so great. we just got a new shipment of blue sportsters that have a new sound system. Um, I'm going to give Pat Miller a call and see if he wants to come in for that test drive. So that's when it really becomes more of a personal, a one-on-one -on -one kind of marketing. Sure. That's amazing. All right. Let's get to some of these questions because I don't want people to like get pitchforks out. I promise we have questions. <laughs> All right. So uh, Terry asks the question, I'm curious how you're approaching post-COVID events. Can you speak to hybrid events or virtual events? What are your thoughts as far as events that have been affected by COVID? Yeah, that's... Um, the crazy thing is that, you know, I'll, I am, I consider myself an event person and I have so many friends in the event space of different types, whether it be bands or sound people or people that work at Pfizer Forum or for the brewers or whatever it might be. Um, and all of a sudden this world that was so, um, filled with events, especially in the greater Milwaukee area was nothing. Thus these, um, virtual and hybrid. And the, the weirdest thing, maybe the irony was that during all this, I taught a class on events <laughs> and that the class was virtual. So um, <laughs> not only, you see, and this is actually my classroom you're in right now. Yeah. This, you know, this is my classroom, um, which is AKA a basement. Exactly. Yeah, I know, sexy. Uh, very. But, um, so that's thus the whiteboard. I just wanted you to know that's why I have a whiteboard <laughs> behind me. Nothing, it's not fancy, not pretty. I wish it were, but um, so I had to take a class that was meant to be teaching events and event planning mm -hmm. and very quickly convert it to something because I only learned maybe a month before that it was going to be virtual. And I had to convert it to something that not only was a virtual class, but that would teach about a brand new, very dominant sector in events, which was virtual. Um, and then also the spinoff hybrid. Um, so typically, you know, just to give you an idea, my class project, I don't have a final exam. I do have a group project, which is the final project. And that project typically is to produce an event. Now this year we couldn't do that because of COVID and the pandemic, all that good stuff. So I had to transition the project into uh, producing a virtual event. And I was just in awe of what students came up with. Um, I did have, and they didn't have to do it. Some students actually did hybrid events 
um, because they could. And it really, the thing that it taught me that virtual events, although, you know, we're all kind of new to them, really. Um, and Pat's doing a masterful job with it here. That, yeah, no, I mean, it's wonderful what you're doing. Um, that virtual events can be really engaging. And they, the great thing to me is they open the audience. What once limited you to people in the local area, you now literally can have attendees from all over the world, you know? So that to me, we, we think in that way that you're not just, um, you're not just building an event for people within a 20 mile radius. Yeah. You're building an event that literally anybody in the world could attend. And what's cool about that, Diane, is that question came from our friend Terry, who's in Victoria, British Columbia. So there you go. That was an I international question just for you. All right, I've got uh, poutine right here. Oh, no. yeah. Bring it on. Yeah. Pass it around. All right. Yes. We have a lot of questions here, but not a lot of time. So we got to go a little bit of lightning round here. Chef Michael Brown, great to see you, Chef, by the way, uh, wants to know, should I use LinkedIn Navigator to reach my niche, which are food truck owners? Would that be a good strategy or would you recommend something else to try and reach, reach food truck owners? You know, I think that LinkedIn is a wonderful thing as a platform from that standpoint. I think that it's it's worth a try. I, I personally am a really big fan of, um, for when you're talking about a, a target demographic like that, uh, Facebook's ability to fine tune and hone in on very, very specific demographics and psychographics of people so that you can place ads for really, uh, you know, as little as 10 or $20 and hone in very specific. If you want, uh, you know, food truck owners that make over $20,000 a year that are located in Fond du Lac um, and that have a dog, you can do that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I can't help help it, Chef, but what, what I would do if I were you, you know where those food trucks are parked during the lunch hour, right? So at two o'clock, by the time they all close after the lunch rush, just host a happy hour for the food truck owners on a Friday afternoon. So they're done at two, yeah. find a bar right in the center of all of them and buy their first beer. And that way you'd meet all of them in one day. Probably a lot cheaper than running a bunch of advertising, but that's that sounds really cool. And I want to hear more about what you're doing. Uh, let's see, Roger has a question. Any ideas on how I can differentiate myself in a service-based industry? Maybe doing an event. He's a speaker. He's a professional speaker. Mm -hmm. So any ideas on maybe hosting an event to help himself get hired to more speaking gigs? Wow, that's an interesting one. You know, and I would have to know a little bit more about the type of people that you would want to hire you. Um, but, you know, overall, I guess the, the first thing that comes to mind is some kind of a, um, a happy hour or networking kind of event where maybe you could showcase some of what you've done and, it, you know, create sort of a win-win atmosphere where people are getting to network, they're getting to meet people, but you're also getting to showcase what you do well. And chances are you're going to get a lot of that um, core customer base that could potentially hire you for um, speaking engagements. That's a good idea. Just so you know, will you defend my honor for a second? They're making fun of me on a Harley. I'm not a Harley rider. But would you tell them that some of your best customers were late 40 pasty guys that work in their basement, please? Come on. There are a lot of guys like me riding a Harley, aren't there? There absolutely are. If you remember, um, now I'm going to forget, what was the, the show that was, uh, it was a cable show. It was all about motorcycles. It was, um, and I'm told it, we had, you know, it's just out of my brain right now, but we had one of their stars um, as a um, as a guest at sure. our event. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he on TV, this show, he was a super tough guy. And he's like, you know, leather and all this kind of thing. And he shows up and um, just to give you a scope here, I'm five, five. Yeah. And he was about three inches smaller than me. Oh, you know, so I'm like, you know, on TV, he looks like this huge, burly yeah, dude. That's right. You know, in reality, he's really not. But yeah, actually, people just like you, actually, just like all of you, ride Harleys. And I know you would probably look fantastic in leather. Oh, at you would. I do. There's no wood about it. I do. <laughs> Uh, and you were, were you talking about Sons of Anarchy? Is that the show you were thinking? Yes. Of? Yes, yes. That yes. one, the motorcycle I just show. couldn't think of it. 
All right. So, I mean, we could go on and on because we're all trying to host great events and you really are a great resource for this. And I hope that we got some good stuff out of Diane because she's a wealth of knowledge here. Well, thank uh, you. But I'm just curious. Uh, my last question would be like, if you had to list off two or three things that are important to have at a great event, like what are the things that come to mind? Do you have any golden rules or things that you had to have at every event because they were the things that you learned made an event go? Just final words of wisdom for us as we put together our own events. Well, you know, a couple of tips that I like to tell everybody, and this is anybody from a meeting planner to a festival producer to a bride, because I do work with all of those and more. But um, one thing to remember is take care of the details first, the small details. Put those details in place well beyond the, you know, months before, if you can, mm -hmm. um, while your brain is fresh and creative, because I guarantee you, by the time you get within a month or less of that event, your brain's going to be fried and so filled with so many other things that you have to do that you're really, all those details are going to go by the wayside. And those little things are oftentimes what make your event better, different, more engaging, more memorable. Um, the other thing, don't, don't put off what you can do now. You know, even though you can create that database um, a week before the event, do it now. If you can do it now, do it, get it out of the way. Um, my, and one of my key philosophies for any event is make sure everybody attending the event is comfortable. Think about comfort. If they're comfortable, they will stay longer. If they have everything they need, they will stay longer you know, think about food, think about beverages, think about seating, think about heat, cold, um, anything else that will make them comfortable. If they are comfortable, they will stay. Those are some great final thoughts. Don't delay, right? Because we think about that. It's like, well, the event's not until November. I'm fine. I'll do it later. And then August comes and September comes. Then you get busy doing other things. Then, oh my God, we're two months out and it's too late. Uh, that those are great pieces of advice. Well, Diane Crowley, I hope you can come back again, because I feel like we're just scratching the surface of all the good stuff you have to come and share with us with events. But thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so we will have Diane. I just volunteered her. She's coming back on again soon. So let's talk <laughs> about events, shall we? Hey, we're planning ahead. The Idea Collective Retreat for Small Business Owners. Hey, hey. Like November it. 5th, 6th, and 7th. It's going to be in Lake Geneva. We're going to host it at the Grand Geneva. It's going to be very swanky. Uh, the announcement is set up for Wednesday, July 7th at 11 o'clock. That's when the big reveal is going to happen. And I will show you who our keynote speakers, plural, are. And they are big time. And yes, you've heard of them. Uh, it's going to be really cool. So reserve the date on the calendar now, July 7th at 11 o'clock. That is the date of the reveal. And you'll want to be there because at the end of the reveal, we will go and put the tickets on sale. And it's important that you're there because there's only 100 of the early bird tickets that will be on sale. So you'll want to be at this event so you can see what's going on. And when you see who's coming, mm, I'm telling you, it's going to be good. All right, more fun stuff. You want more fun stuff, I say? Okay, fine. We launched our newest Quick Trip giveaway. It's our Independence Day giveaway. And I'm not sure how easily you can see that screen, but I love this thing. We're giving away a $50 Quick Trip gift card so you can buy supplies for your Independence Day party. And your choice of a patriotic t-shirt from Tipsy L's. And they've got like a million different goofy patriotic t-shirts. But this one's really funny. Get in, loser. We're going to the moon. That just made me laugh. <laughs> so uh, put your name in the box on the 28th of June. We'll pick a winner. That should be enough time that we can ship the t-shirt to you in time. But the link is coming up on the screen right now. And we do these contests just for fun because we love Quick Trip and we just want to say thanks for being a part of our little community here. So there's no like ulterior motive. Just put your name in the box because free stuff is fun. One other thing I want to share, and, and there is no political commentary to this, but I've been keeping an eye on the COVID-19 numbers in the state of Wisconsin. And this is the lowest I have seen this chart ever since I've been paying attention to it. I've been looking at tracking this account's uh, Twitter account, getting a notification every time they tweet. And you would be amazed, by the way, at the stuff that the Wisconsin Health Department tweets. It, it just insane. It, I'm not going to soapbox. Anyway, this particular number, 112 confirmed cases, is the lowest this number has been that I've ever seen. 
So draw your own conclusion, but I've been watching this number go down and down and down and down and down, and that is a nice thing to see. All right, last thing. If you're not a member of the Idea Collective community yet, you can get a free year thanks to our friends at Bank59. Hit their website, bank59.com slash idea collective, and you could score a free year in our community. A big thanks to Diane for coming on today. Of course, a big thank you to you for tuning in and our sponsors, Bank59, Serendipity Labs, and Quick Trip. Speaking of... We're going to drift off now to the quick trip after party and say hello to some of the folks that we don't know yet inside the audience today. Make sure you watch this episode or future episodes on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash idea collective. I'm Pat Miller, the idea coach. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.